from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C.
office and the collections of the Library of Congress. Uh, so I'll actually talk twice and hopefully briefly. The first part is about repertoire and rare items, and the second thing that I'll talk about is performance practice and how it's actually the practice of performing <laughs> rather than anything that one can actually learn or read about. Sorry? So I had prepared a couple of comments, and then when I arrived on Wednesday or Thursday, uh, I was allowed to see a lot of Landowska's music, which is now in the collection of the Library of Congress. And what I found is a lot of things which indicate how specifically she used this instrument. Uh, the first instruments that were made on this model were made in 1912. So in fact, it's the 100th anniversary of the Playel harpsichord, which is a very strange uh, kind of harpsichord, a very strange kind of instrument. It's a masterpiece of over-design. <laughs> uh, but for one reason or another, this, this was actually requested by Landowska and agreed upon by the technicians of Playel. So the instruments that Playel made uh, before 1912 didn't have the 16-foot register, which the instruments that were made from 1912 actually did have. One of the reasons that this instrument was such a desirable thing is because everyone was looking into Bach interpretation, even 100 years ago, 110, 120 years ago. And the idea was to find the Bach harpsichord. And there was an instrument already in Berlin, in the Musical Instruments Museum, which is still there. And uh, that instrument had a 16-foot stop. Whether or not it was original from the 18th century or a later edition was never particularly clear, especially in 1912, when these instruments first started to be made. The reason that the instruments were over-designed is, uh, in my opinion, the fact that when Arnold Dolmetsch started making five octave clavichords, he copied virtually 18th century instruments. And the soundboard of a five octave clavichord is not much bigger than the soundboard of that instrument. And five octave clavichords from the 18th century, or copies of those instruments, mm -hmm. tend to stay in tune for a very, very long period of time, basically months, if you don't move them. But at the moment you open a window, on a, with a harpsichord, or the moment you move it out of a building, it has to be retuned. And because of piano technology and harp technology, it was more or less decided that this was sort of an undesirable effect. So all of this over-design in fine tuning with tuning pins and an enormous, enormous amount of metal that was integrated into the structure of the instrument, it actually didn't work because the playels go out of tune just as easily as a traditionally made instrument. Unfortunately, the design didn't really work. And the Tascaf family of harpsichord makers uh, actually retained in their collection in Paris an instrument made in 1769, which is now in Edinburgh. So Playel actually had one of the most beautiful antiques, even in our time, to study in 1900, 1905, 1910. But they decided to do this. And the pedals were an absolute necessity as well, to change registers very, very quickly and everything. So when Landowska first started playing these instruments in 1905, 6, 7, and when she had the new instrument in 1912, it was a completely new sound and no one knew what was going on. Which is the reason that I decided to come out and play and not give anybody a program. <laughs> uh, just just to, add to, the, to add to the curiosity of, of the affair. Uh, and also programming at that time was not, it was strictly made up by the performer. Uh, so you could have Bird and Purcell and Froberger all in the same suite. You could have Bach and Handel and Scarlatti and, and Rameau and Chambonnier in the same suite. It wasn't the same sort of thing as we think of elegant programming on paper these days. Anyway, a lot of these materials survive in the Landowska collection at the Library of Congress. And Landowska's collections basically fall into two categories. They fall into the pre-1940 category, which is when she had to leave France because she was Jewish. and the Nazis were after her, 
uh, published documents and everything. Uh, and the souvenir, which we have just published uh, by Paradiso, is this uh, CD-ROM and recording, which contains uh, hundreds of documents of everything that is not preserved by the Library of Congress, but it's a full uh, documentation of 1927 to 1940. Then the Library of Congress, in their holdings, has a lot of interesting materials because some of them date from after 1940, but some materials that uh, survive from before 1940 were obviously retrieved from Landowska's residence outside of Paris. So some of the things I found, I thought I would just pass by you. Um, unfortunately, for, for show and tell, we have no backlit projector or anything, but I can just show certain things. Uh, in, in this category of repertoire and rare items. Here is a full copy of The Bells of William Byrd, in which Landowska has annotated all of her uh, fingerings, which hand plays what. And what you find from these fingerings is a kind of super legato, which was really necessary on a play L harpsichord because the sound lasts forever unless you let the key up. When you release the key, there's absolutely nothing left. So this is one of the reasons why she made so many substitute fingerings. And also, she recorded this piece the first time she came uh, to America, because she always came with one or two playel harpsichords. And just to give an idea, well, Bird was very exotic repertoire in the teens and 20s. People hadn't heard it. The Fitzwilliam original book had been published, but very few people actually performed the repertoire, and no one at all recorded it. Also, a piece called The Fall of the Leaf by Barton Pearson, which I'll play later on the clavichord, an arrangement of one of the Pretorius dances from Tapsicor, uh, a completely unknown galliard that was originally written for lute by Jacopo Poroné, a piece of Giovanni Picchi, who was a, uh, an Italian, a, a Venetian, sorry, uh, in manuscript by Landowska, and from a collection which was completely and totally unknown at the point that she copied this out. A copy of Purcell Grounds from a British manuscript museum, which is not as the, the same as the printed version. <laughs> a full uh, Blessed Virgin's expostulation of Purcell with a full continuo realization and registrations written. Um, her copy, which was removed from the complete works of Johann Caspar Ferdinand Fischer of the famous Passacaglia that she always played. A very mysterious dialogue for organ by Nicolas de Grigny. Uh, her write, in her writings, she talks about a magnificent dialogue of Nicolas de Grigny, but we have, no one ever knew which one she was talking about until I found it two days ago. <laughs> because in the de Grigny, it's the only one which is taken out uh, from the, the, the rest of the book, and it has her registrations and her fingerings. And also, uh, one of the very famous pieces that Landowska recorded in the 50s, which was a remote transcription of the Air Grave pour deux Polonais from Les Anne Galantes, and here it is in her, uh, in her manuscript copy, which is different from the version that we actually have of that piece from the 18th century. The other curiosity of the, the, uh, the music, which is preserved in the Landowska Collection of the Library of Congress, is also several of Landowska's own pieces, because she wrote extensively for the harpsichord and for the piano, and she also wrote from time to time for instrumental ensembles or even vocal ensembles. So this is also uh, an example of one of her compositions, which one can find in this collection. And I'll save the rest, which is about performance practice. This is about curiosities and music, and the rest uh, for later is more about performance practice. So now to the clavichord, two small pieces, uh, both of which uh, Landowska played. She recorded one, she didn't record the other. Uh, this play on harpsichord was made in the 1920s or perhaps the 1930s. Uh, the serial number is there, the date hasn't been quite tracked down, and it was rather marvelously restored by Thomas and Barbara Wolf, and Barbara Wolf is also, has also taken phenomenal care of both of these instruments for this concert, so she should be thanked. Thank you. 
clavichord was made by John Chalice uh, before he moved to New York, when he was still living in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, and it was, it's also from the mid to late 40s, and it was one of the instruments that uh, Landowska had in Lakeville, uh, Connecticut. And it's also part of the Library of Congress's collection. Two short pieces. Um, the clavichord is slightly amplified for the hall because it's quite soft. It also has metal in the inside, which would have been better to avoid for volume level and acoustic and resonance. The microphone on the harpsichord is only for the recording, so the harpsichord is actually not mic'd, just for interpreting.
collection, uh, which also, of course, includes photographs, other documents, letters, checkbook stubs, anything you can imagine <laughs> uh, that was in Landowska's possession when she died in 1959. Uh, we talk a lot about performance practice and have done probably too much. Landowska basically invented what we generally attribute to Nicolas Haunoncourt and Gustav Leonhardt, in fact. She was the first person to really, really look into libraries, to look into original sources. There was also Dolmetsch, but Landowska had an energy that Dolmetsch actually didn't have. Dolmetsch did many, many, many things, and many of the things that he did were rather unplanned and experimental, although he was a, a, a super talent. But Landowska not only was a super talent, but she had a, a sense of mission, which was unique, an enormous amount of discipline, and she just had an enormous amount of direction. She had a mission statement before the idea ever existed on grant applications, one could say. And what I think is interesting about what she did as a performer is that even though there was an enormous amount of research, an enormous amount of discipline, it never removed the nonchalance from her performances. Because I think that what is missing today in performance is exactly the idea of nonchalance. It should be done the way it's done in your house, I think. Too much professionalism, I think, is unhealthy. Landowska really didn't like the idea very much either. And the idea of doing something for a small audience is something which should also be accepted. Landowska designed a concert hall which only sat 80 or 100 people, but she was perfectly happy with her audience every time. And one thing that she began that we usually don't give her credit for is the difference between text and improvisation. Uh, because since she was a trained pianist and a trained composer even, uh, she really did have lots of ideas about the, uh, the, the obvious differences between what we would now call respect to the text and improvisation. So she did a lot of both, in fact. For instance, here is um, from the Rameau edition of 1731. This was all done before photocopy machines, <laughs> of course, which is a luxury we have today. But when she was doing this research, in Berlin in the teens and in Paris and in Saint Louis in the 20s and 30s. Sometimes assistants would copy out music. Most of the time she had to do it herself. So here is Rameau's table of ornaments in Landowska's handwriting from the Rameau 1731 Caisse de She wanted to know how to do it, and so not having the photocopy machine, she wrote it out from the original performance practice. Everyone wanted to know how the ornaments were played and what was on the beat and what was off the beat. And Landowski is perhaps the first and last person who said, what if it's not on or off the beat? That's to say, what if there is no beat? What if we're not tied to a metronome? And this is where she got the idea of an improvised style of, of, uh, of performance, in fact. So her respect to the text was absolutely to the letter, but she used so much of what we would now call rubato, instead of calling it what it should be properly called, which is musical expression, that she's no longer credited for this. Then you have, for instance, Aramo Gavotte, the famous one that everybody plays from the Pièce de Clavecin of 1728. There is a question of whether this is played on one manual or two manuals, etc. So Landowska got to this, and she wrote herself musical examples of what Rameau would have done in notation if he had wanted it on one keyboard or on two keyboards. And then, just so that she doesn't forget, you have a handwritten uh, document of what she was thinking about, so she wouldn't forget it when she had to teach it. Something else concerning performance practice. For instance, here is the beginning of a modern edition of one of her uh, one of the Mozart sonatas that she played, in which she writes in her famous purple ink at the top a quotation from C.P.E. Bach, which is basically, uh, it's a pity that the idea of ornamented repeats is dying out so quickly. <laughs> so Landowski was onto all this stuff before anyone else was. Here is a, a print of an edition which Landowska owned of the famous Turkish 
march from the A minor uh, piano sonata, with what she considered to be an ortex edition, where the first four notes are written in ornaments, and what she considered a corrupt modern edition in which the ornaments are transcribed into note values, and to play this rhythm is as, is as amateur in 2012 as it was in 1912 but lots of professional pianists still do it <laughs> because they either have it in their ear or the edition that they're using is faulty. Then you have other very interesting things. This is um, a complete score, uh, including the quartet, quartet parts and solo harpsichord parts of the G minor harpsichord concerto, which is marked at the top WL Saint-Leu. So this Bach G minor concerto uh, actually dates from the days of Saint-Leu. How it reached America after 1940, no one knows. But in fact, uh, Landowska, uh, she wrote in almost every bar number, every time she had to rehearse or make a recording or perform with an orchestra. And she uh, also wrote in violin bowings and cello bowings. Uh, and I had, all, I had been told about this actually by Yehudi Menuhin, because one day I asked him what it was like to Form the Bach uh, violin and harpsichord sonatas with Landowska. And he said, she gave me the music and all the bowings were written in. And she said, please follow the bowings because they come not from me, but from Leopold Mozart. <laughs> anyway, that's what Menuhin said. <laughs> However, uh, we, 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 one cannot know. But in any case, perhaps uh, in Menuhin's collection, we'll, we'll find Landowska's bowings that were at least based on Leopold Mozart. What's actually very strange in this one, which is difficult to believe that these bowings came from Leopold Mozart, is that she puts upbeats and downbeats all with down bow. So what she writes in her score is bum bum, bum bum, and then normal. Dum, ba, da, 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 dum, bum. So this is still in the modern string playing tradition where um, where an up bow is just as strong as a down bow. And that's something which Leopold Mozart absolutely never wrote about. <laughs> so this is a 20th century uh, curiosity and interpretive liberty, uh, which is written on the page by uh, Landowska. The other thing, which is a bit curious, is that uh, we know from the A major harpsichord concerto that sometimes even in the solo harpsichord concerto, there was an accompanying harpsichord. And uh, Landowska performed and recorded the D minor concerto, 1052, always with a continuo harpsichord. And I had heard that there was a written out continuo part, but I never saw it. And in a box, two days ago, I found the written out continuo part to the, to the uh, middle movement of the G minor harpsichord concerto, which is also there. Then, from this music, we move on to something else that Landowska did as well or better, I think, than playing the harpsichord, which was playing the piano. I think that Landowska went out of fashion in the early 60s because of Playel harpsichords. There was a lot of resistance to instruments with metal. There was lots of resistance to instruments which were not based on uh, traditional instruments. This instrument, which was made by Tom and Barbara Wolf very recently, is a very similar model to what Landowska's technicians at Playel had available. It's a mid-18th century Parisian instrument, five octaves, two manuals, two eighths and a four without a 16 foot stop. And it, all one has to do really is compare visually these two instruments to see exactly what Playel did to what they were actually basing uh, their, their model on. And this instrument is much louder and has much more carrying power than this instrument does. Mm -hmm. So this brings us to the modern instrument, because Landowska didn't play on the forte piano. She had instruments, square <coughs> pianos, in Saint-Leu that were in working condition, and she used to practice Haydn and Mozart on these instruments with light touch and small hammers, etc., etc. And her interest in Haydn and Mozart provoked her uh, to write, after lots and lots of sketching, cadenzas for several Mozart piano concerti. Here is a sketch. Uh, here is a finished copy of K271. And all of these things are just in the next building for everyone to see. She was also into the idea of improvisation during Mozart uh, piano sonatas. So here you have from K333 cadenzas 
uh, not even for a concerto, but for a piano sonata that are written out. And the last example, which is one of my favorites, is um, her uh, either work or performance score uh, to the Poulenc concerto. And where the harpsichord enters, it says at the top, make sure to tell the conductor to wait for me until my hands are on the keyboard. <laughs> so not only did she copy Boeing's for Yehudi Menuhin, but she didn't take attitude from conductors. <laughs> so that's part of her, that's part of her uh, historic uh, presence. But I would encourage people to see, uh, to see these uh, printed materials in the Library of Congress. They're basically filed under uh, music scores which are not annotated by Landowska and music scores which are annotated by Landowska or a member of her, uh, of her household. But the members of her household uh, were very well trained uh, to do all the same registrations and all the same fingerings that they had watched Landowska do for 20 or 30 or even 40 years. And Landowska was particularly fond of uh, 17th and 18th century French music. Uh, and she was, she was a French citizen, and she was very, very proud of that. Uh, and so her special affection for, for French music had something to do with the fact that the music, one of the trademarks of the, of the repertoire is that it can be either very tall, but sort of naive, rustic almost, or it can be very sort of muscly and, 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 and grand and royal. And I think that the reason why Landowska had such an attachment to that French repertoire is that that's the way she thought of herself. She was constantly making fun of herself. She took herself so seriously <laughs> that, in fact, sometimes she had to stand, stand back uh, and actually make fun of herself, which she enjoyed doing. So she had an amazing sense of humor. I think a sound of which she annotated heavily, but which she never recorded. <laughs> <laughs>
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.